Marty uh, uh, was uh, born in California and moved to South Carolina, uh, graduated from Dorman High, uh, joined the Navy as a nuclear uh, engineer, and when we turn the lights down, I want to make sure he doesn't glow. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and if you're going to be in the Navy, by the way, service on an aircraft carrier, you can't beat the duty. I served on an aircraft carrier in the Korean War, and I can guarantee you that it's very good. Uh, he uh, left the Navy and uh, became an EMT. Uh, and before he started his interest in gardening, and then decided that uh, with hitting the area of horticulture, uh, is now certified uh, and uh, has started his own company. And uh, so, and additionally, uh, I really wanted to talk about that. It started a bamboo nursery, and uh, so. You know, uh, we all think bamboo is being very aggressive and so forth. I think we're going to uh, shed some blame on that today. So, Aaron McCarty, it's yours. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm honored to be here. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to hear me speak about permaculture. Um, you're probably going to hear some ideas that you might not have thought about um, that can seem kind of negative at first. Um, some big issues that permaculture uh, is concerned with. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask you if you could to just keep an open mind as best you can as I go through this presentation. Um, so this right here is Easter Island. So it's 2,300 miles away from Peru, and it's uh, 1,300 miles away from the Polynesian, uh, I believe it's Pitcairn Islands. They're up in here. You can't even see them. They're so small here. Uh, Hawaii is about here. So this island here is in the middle of the Pacific, literally. It's 2,300 miles away from the mainland, from, from a continent, and 1,300 miles away from a little, a little chain of little islands. And so this, this particular island, you may have seen these before. Um, this is from Easter Island. Um, there was a, a civilization around about 600 AD that they came from Polynesia. And they traveled in little boats that were made out of trees, hollowed out canoes. They traveled over two weeks to reach this island in the middle of the Pacific. And they landed there, and they lived there until their complete collapse, which happened, um, started happening around 1600 AD. So they were there roughly 800 years before they started collapsing. And the reason why this is important to talk about is because this civilization lived its entire existence in the middle of the Pacific Ocean having no contact with any civilization. As far as these people knew on this island, they were the only people in the world. And they rose and fell. And we've studied what we know mostly is, you know, with, we found through our, um, excavations, um, studying the soil to figure out what they ate, and they had different diets than, the, than your typical Polynesian because the island had certain characteristics. But, these, little, these figures here, the biggest one was 270 tons. The average was about 90. There were 12 tribes that lived on this island. And what they did was they competed with each other to build the biggest statue. And you see this guy here, that thing on his head at the top? Those were very heavy and they competed to see who can get the biggest, you know, biggest hat on top. Uh, and so that's, for the most part, these 12, these 12 tribes were, were, they lived together mostly peacefully because the nature of the island, they had to share resources with each other. Now this island was uh, 66 square miles, so it's not very big. And what they ended up doing at one point in their civilization, they actually cut the last tree down on this island, the last tree. Now, you have to have, they had to have these massive trees to, to, to do this, uh, to, to make these statues. I mean, these things are massive. I mean, 
270 tons. That's, you know, this is a, it, up there with the, with the pyramids and how they were erected, and we just don't really know how. We've, we've tried uh, with, with a crane that can do 55 tons, and they were able to get one up, um, but not without great effort. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a challenge to do. And you can see, and I don't even know why, but you see this, you see they excavated. Now these guys were all sitting on these, on these stones here. Okay, and somehow ended up being buried. I'm not sure exactly how. I don't know if it was from erosion that that happened or what, but once the tribe, once they, once they basically they went through their resource base, they, they cut the last tree down, and from that point on, it was, they descended into cannibalism. Um, that's how their civilization pretty much ended. They ended up in the late 1800s with 111 people left. So it was pretty much a complete collapse. And the reason why this is important is because now we have a global civilization. Okay? They all shared their resources on this island, and like I said, as far as I knew, they were the only. They didn't have anyone to trade with. They didn't have anywhere they could escape to once, once, you know, they, went, once they cut their last tree down. They had nowhere to go. They had to stay there. They survived on eating rats and then each other. And uh, this happened. And so the reason why this is important, specifically with, with regards to the permaculture, is because permaculture is concerned with energy. Uh, and the energy it takes to run a civilization like we have, a global civilization. Here's where it gets, can get emotional for some people. And I'm going to cover it. Um, so we'll start here. This thing's not really working too well. Uh, I'm just going to walk over here and show you. This here is oil discovery. So we're looking at 1980. Oil discoveries. So you can see oil discoveries have gone down. And this is conventional petroleum, conventional crude, crude oil okay? discoveries. It starts going down, right? Well, you can look at population, though. Okay? Oil production here. Oil production is going up and up and up. We're, we're recovering more and more and more oil globally. You can watch population go up with it. That's not an accident. When JFK was president, there were two billion people on planet Earth for the first time in the history of our species. Two billion. We're at seven, just about now. Seven billion. And the only reason why is because of petroleum. That's just, that's a fact. There's an analogy I like to use. Imagine you're a little field mouse and you're in a meadow. You're in, you're, you're in a, a meadow and you're next to a road, and here comes a big tractor trailer hauling a load of grain. Well, the tractor trailer, for whatever reason, tips over, and all this grain falls into your meadow, and you're a field mouse. Well, you're going to have an explosion in your population, because all of a sudden you have this one-time surplus of energy, essentially, that available to you. So the mouse population explodes. Once, that, once all that grain runs out that's only there because of the accident, however, you go back to the natural carrying capacity of that meadow. And so here we are. This is the bad news, okay? This is, it's, it's all positive from here, I promise. This is, this is the part that's hard for a lot of people. A lot of people don't believe it, they don't want to believe it, but the fact of the matter is you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And we only have one planet, just this one that we're on. And we can't continue to grow infinitely, especially not on a limited resource that required millions of years, billions of years to, to come into existence. An entire civil, uh, an entire all the dinosaurs had to die. All the, all the flora of that time died. Ancient algal blooms in the ocean, all that turned into oil over immense pressures in time. And we're not going to get that again. That's a one-time thing on planet Earth. We have one supply. And that's what we use to run our civilization. Okay, so what is permaculture? This is Bill Mollison here. He's the founder of permaculture. He's an Australian. And as is uh, David Holmgren, who you'll see on the next slide. Um, and this is his definition, an integrated, evolving system of perennial or self-perpetuating plant and animal species useful to man. Permaculture is all about perennial food crop cultivation, medicine, food, fuel, fiber. Um, this is David Holmgren, he's the co-founder, and he's also, his book, uh, Permaculture, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, is the one that I use to basically put this together, this presentation together. Um, this is his definition uh, in this book, consciously designed landscapes which mimic the patterns and relationships found in nature while yielding an abundance of food, fiber, and energy for the provision of local needs. 
local needs. Because our global civilization that requires all this energy to run and that is fiber optically connected via the internet, the dirty little secret is that it requires petroleum energy. We wouldn't be eating everything in this room at one point has been on a truck or a ship. It's been, it's been made, uh, it's been made out of natural resources. Those, those had to be, in the case of wood, the trees had to be cut down. In the case of metal, had to be mined. Immense amounts of petroleum energy go into just, just that aspect of it. Never mind shipping it around or just in time trucking. And then as I'll get into later, our, our food production, our, you know, our huge monoculture food production requires it from start to finish. Okay, this is in Austria. Uh, uh, Set Holzer is the name of the, of the fellow who, who owns this. This is just a part of his land. Um, he's, a, he's, he's a permaculturist, but interestingly enough, he spent most of his life just doing permaculture and never doesn't, wasn't taught it. And then only recently in, in a book that he just put out, called Seth Holzer's Permaculture, he just recently um, affiliated himself with permaculture. But he's been pretty pretty influential on me for me and some of the techniques I use, especially I'll go into later, called Hugel Culture. You may have heard of that before. He's, he's pretty much responsible for bringing that. That's Seth Holzer there. Um, and like I say, he's, he's been very influential. He's, he's known uh, as the rebel farmer. Um, he's been in trouble with the Austrian government for things such as not pruning his fruit, tr fruit trees. Um, but he also does things that no one else does because if you look, let me go back to the last slide. This right here, these are ma these are ponds, but these are also major energy. That th these these are going to collect solar energy and they're going to create macro microclimates. They're storing energy. One of the things that those ponds are doing. But it'll it'll enable you to grow things. It enables him to do things that he otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So this is. Coming closer ethics here. Um, this is it for ethics. Care of the earth, care of the people, and share the surplus. It's pretty simple. This drives, the, this is the ethics of permaculture right here. So I won't spend too much time talking about it. It's in the center here. Now, each one of these is a principle. David Holmgren talks about, you can, you can think of this as a clock. And so if we, if we think that we have a problem, we want to solve a problem, we want to think about it, and, and we're going to use these principles these permaculture principles to solve our problem. We're going to start with this here, which is observe and interact, which I'll, I'll go to shortly. And, and, sorry about that. and we'll go around the clock, and we'll go to each different principle, and we'll apply that principle to our problem, and we'll go all the way around, and we'll start over again at the beginning. And, and this, is, this, is the, this is what guides permaculturists, this process, in, in their design thinking. We use all these principles to design our landscapes.